Okay, we're back and we're doing something a little different here. We're doing some modern physics, in particular some quantum mechanics. One of the great mysteries, <laughs> I guess you could say, in our ChemPhys program is uh, and, and a, a question I get countless times over the years is that those quantum numbers that you have to memorize in chemistry um, talking about electron configurations and the periodic table and so on is where do they come from? Uh, you, you don't really have the time to get into where they come from in chemistry you just have to kind of memorize what they are, the rules, how to put it all together here we're, we're going to have a, a very simple example a one-dimensional example to show where these these integers in particular come from, these quantum numbers. So the gist of quantum mechanics is weirdness, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, I, I guess the original idea was that energy comes in bundles. They come in little particles, I guess you could say, little packets of energy called quanta. Uh, nowadays we call them photons. And if you know the frequency of, of a photon, of, of the light, you can figure out its energy. That's what Max Planck told us back in 1900. In chemistry, you start to get into the weird structure of atoms. It's not the simple solar system. You, you talk about electron waves, you talk about the electron clouds around the nucleus and energy levels and this and that. You talk about particle wave duality, where electrons actually behave like waves. That explains the uh, stability of atoms, for example. You talk about the uncertainty principle. You know things are weird when a, a, a law of nature is called uncertainty. Um, we won't go into this at all, but instead we're going to deal with the Schrodinger equation. This is kind of the guts of, of quantum mechanics from the 1920s. It's the F equals MA of, of the quantum world. F equals MA does not work for particles and atoms and things like this. It, it, it's just wrong. So a new set of mechanics, a new set of rules was needed called quantum mechanics, and the Schrodinger equation is, is kind of the guts of that. So this uh, basically is what we call the time-independent Schrodinger equation. It looks weird. Now people in MV calculus might recognize this upside-down triangle here. Uh, it's it's a three-dimensional operator. It's uh, in this case it's squared, so it's it's second derivatives, partial derivatives. Uh, it, it can be pretty hard mathematically to solve this thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a one-dimensional case, a very simplified problem, uh, to reduce this down to something that we can do. We will have the mathematics to do it. Um, but to get beyond some of the mystery of the Schrodinger equation, I just wanted to outline the again the gist of it the the basics of it this first term is kind of the quantum way of writing kinetic energy believe it or not <laughs> take my word for it right now the second term this is v of r function uh, it it depends on the problem this is really the part that this uh, this v quantity is uh, a potential. It basically is a potential energy term. That's what it's related to. And that's the thing that, that's going to vary from problem to problem. That's the part you have to identify in a problem, stick in whatever that function happens to be, and then try to solve it. Now, really, in, in classical physics, what we do when we add kinetic and potential together is we get our total energy. And that's what's on the right-hand side. So in, in essence, this Schrodinger equation is kind of a conservation of energy. It's, it, it kind of tells you the total energy of your system. I'm going to erase that for now. Um, in chemistry, I, I believe it's presented just like this in your textbook. Um, the, this thing in the brackets is called the Hamiltonian operator. It's basically your total energy that, that's given on the right-hand side. And the psi, the pitchfork, is called the wave function. That's part of that weirdness of quantum theory, quantum mechanics, where um, particles and waves, they basically are interchangeable. Um, and so every, everything in the Schrodinger equation is kind of described as a, in its wave form, even particles. 
that's kind of the structure of the Schrodinger equation. So here's the problem. We're going to look at what we call an infinite potential well. It, it basically is, um, imagine if you have a box and you put a ball in there, a, a real good super ball, and you whip it against one of the walls, and it's just going to bounce back and forth. Okay? It's kind of the idea, except instead of a super ball, we're going to get really small, and maybe it's a single electron bouncing between two walls. And so these walls are thick, so to speak, uh, so the electron is stuck between the walls. Now, because it's only one-dimensional, it's only going side to side, uh, this weird thing, this upside-down triangle, reduces down to a second derivative, just a plain old second derivative. And what's more is we're going to say that uh, this electron is in the ground state. It, it's in its lowest energy. There's no potential energy. So our V term, okay, this V thing up here in the Schrodinger equation is zero. So think about what that's going to leave. I'll, I'll, let me rewrite it down here. We have some constants times the second derivative. There is no V, so this, this is what operates on whatever the wave function of this electron is. And that's going to tell us what the energy of the electron is. Now it's real tempting to say, um, don't these pitchforks, these wave functions just cancel out? Not quite, and the reason is we have this second derivative. It's an operator. So it, it's operating on whatever the wave function is. So it's probably better for me to go ahead and, and write it like this. Just that it's the second derivative of whatever the operator is, or the wave function. Okay, well, this looks like it could be challenging. I'm going to rewrite it slightly differently. Let me get all the constants together on the right-hand side. Now, if you look at this, uh, hopefully it reminds you of something from normal physics, from classical physics. This is simple harmonic motion. Okay, maybe in a different color. Let me put over here the equation for using f equals ma for a spring. ma equals negative kx. If we rewrite acceleration as the second derivative of position with respect to time, get all of our constants together on the right hand side, this is our equation. For that, This is just an oscillating spring. These two things are identical mathematically. You've got a second derivative on the left hand side, you have a minus sign, you have constants, and then you've got your variable. Okay. We know the solution <coughs> over here for <coughs> a spring, <coughs> an object bouncing back and forth on a spring. <coughs> Excuse me. It goes as a, a sine wave or a cosine. Okay. It, it's oscillating. It's periodic. So that means, <coughs> mathematically, <coughs> our wave function has to follow something similar. Now our variable isn't time, it, it's position in the Schrodinger equation. So we're going to have some different constant multiplied by the position in there. But it's, it's a sine wave. So the nature of the problem tells us what this wave function thing has to be. So in fact, even though we're talking about an electron, a ball, bouncing back and forth, it's being described by a sine function. It looks kind of more like a wave in a sense. Okay, now what we can do with this is, I guess, a couple things. Um, the first thing is, uh, what's this? What's this k value? You know, what what does that mean? Okay, what I'm going to do is, is if we go ahead, if we do two derivatives over here. OK, 
Okay, so what we have, if we follow what we know about springs and harmonic motion, uh, over here on the right, we, we know that this omega is the square root of the constants over here on the, the right-hand side. Okay, it's square root of k over m. So what that means over here is that our constant, that's equal to the square root of the constants on the right-hand side of this equation, which is 2 times the mass of the electron times its energy all over h bar squared. Okay, But there's something else that we can do with this, and that's the, the walls. Okay, We know that this electron can't go past the walls on either side. These are called boundary conditions. And what that means is that at those two x positions, the two walls, because the electron can't exist there in, in the wall, uh, the wave function, which describes the particle and its position, has to be zero. So now, what that means is that if we're using a sine function for our, our wave function, uh, that looks all fine and good for x equals zero. Because the sine of zero is zero, and so that matches our boundary condition. But the thing is, at the other wall, our constant times L, if that's our x position, that also has to be zero. Okay, so think about where is sine zero? That means that KL, these, these constants in there, has to be, it could be zero, or pi, or two pi, or three pi, and so on. In other words, k times the, this length of, you know, the, the, the distance between the walls is an integer times pi. Okay, that's the quantum number. There's an integer. An integer is part of our solution to this particular problem of an electron bouncing between walls. So what I'll do is combine these two expressions here for the k, for our constant, and let's just finish this off. Okay? Um, k can be written as the square root of 2 times the mass times the energy over h bar squared, or it can be written as an integer times pi over that distance. We can solve for the energy, solve for e. We have to square things. So we're going to have an n squared, pi squared, h bar squared, all over 2 times the mass electron times this distance squared. That's the key, though. The integer appears. The energy of this electron is proportional to an integer squared, but an integer. Okay? Energy is quantized. This means the energy can only have very specific certain values that are allowed. That's very different. For a super ball in a box bouncing between two walls, that thing can have any energy that it wants, a continuum. Turn that super ball into something really small bouncing back and forth, like an electron, and only certain values are allowed. So we say the energy is naturally quantized for that electron. It has energy levels, just like in an atom. That's where these quantum numbers come from when you start talking about atoms and the periodic table. It's more complicated because it's three-dimensional, so there's three different integers that you get from very sophisticated solutions. Um, the only thing I'll point out is that this wave function that we figured out, the sine function, when you square that, that talks about the probability of where you're going to find the electron at, at different positions. Okay, so that's going to be proportional to sine squared of this constant times its position. So quantum mechanics is weird, no question about it. But uh, also these integers, these quantum numbers, naturally appear when you have bound states of electrons. 
whether it's between two walls like this or if it's in 